Welcome to Calvary Church with Skip Heitzig. We're so glad you've joined us today. In Paul's letter to the Colossians, he declares that Jesus holds everything together, from the majestic to the microscopic and everything in between, work and family, friendships and faith. In this series, Pastor Skip explores the practical application of Jesus's preeminence so we can make sure that Jesus is at the center of it all. Always only Jesus, Welcome, welcome. Welcome to church. We're glad that you came. This is the very first of our weekend services, and we're glad that you've joined us. We're also glad that you've joined us online. We're glad if you're watching us in Santa Fe at our campus or on the west side at our campus, or if you're watching from England or Stockholm, Sweden, or Canada, or all the other places we get um, notes from. Thank you for joining us for Calvary Church at Home Thank you for coming to the campus and joining us for our first feedback worship service. Yeah, we're going we're gonna to get that. So uh, as they're getting that um, all dialed in, let me just make another pitch for Wednesday nights. Wednesday nights uh, is the study that is sort of central to the, to uh, my, it's really my wheelhouse. It's what I love to do. It's, it's verse by verse, chapter by chapter through the whole Bible. I had a visitor here the other night from Texas who watches us online, and she was a bit amazed that we have gone through the whole Bible like four or now five times we're on that trek and every verse of it. And so we, we want to invite you out. Uh, we're right at the point in the story when David will become uh, inaugurated as the king of Israel. So uh, you want to come out Wednesday night to get that. Turn in your Bibles, please, to the book of Colossians chapter 1. Colossians chapter 1. Uh, this is a series called Always Only Jesus, and uh, turn to Colossians 1. Also, uh, do you do this? Do you have like little pieces of paper in your Bible that you can make a, put a mark, or you have these little ribbons? Put a marker in two other places, and that is uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and the book of Romans chapter 8, Romans 8, 2 Corinthians 5, just because there's supplemental material. Now, I probably don't need to tell you this, but we do exposition. So what that means is I am tethered to the text of Scripture. You don't go outside the text of Scripture when it comes to exposition because, and here's why we do it, we believe that no preacher can come up with something more profound to say than what God has already said in His Word. You don't need to hear the opinion or rally cry of some preacher. You need to know what God says in His Word. So that's why we're committed to expositional teaching and preaching. So Colossians chapter 1, Father, bless the teaching of Your Word. We pray that we would grow in grace and knowledge But, Father, that we will grow to know you more personally and appreciate you more deeply. For we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Any human relationship has tension. And not only tension, but it can develop into disagreement, annoyance, even anger. So there was a very famous Irish boxer who became a preacher, and he was setting up his evangelistic tent in a new city he had never been to before. He's getting everything ready, and in walk two thugs, two bullies, and they start heckling this preacher. They don't know his background. They just start heckling this preacher and saying foul things to him and trying to provoke something. Preacher just keeps doing what he's doing, getting ready for uh, the meeting. And uh, so one of these thugs comes closer and hits the ex-boxer preacher (laughs) right upside the head on the cheek, on the right cheek. He shakes it off, sticks out his jaw and turns the other cheek to the left. The guy hauls off and hits him a second time. 
At that point, the preacher takes off his coat, rolls up his sleeves, and says, the good Lord has given me no further instructions, <laughs> and laid him out on the ground. We like stories like that because we, in our core, like the idea of retaliation and revenge and people getting what they deserve to get. But God has given us further instructions. And the further instruction is a word we're going to examine, the word reconciliation. That's where relationships that are broken get made right again. Now, you've heard the term reconciliation probably a number of times in relationship to especially marriage, where a couple that is estranged decides that they are going to reconcile, or they have a disagreement even in their marriage. It could be a good marriage, but they need to reconcile because something has gotten in the way that has formed an obstacle in that relationship. That is what God has done for us in the substitutionary death of His Son, Jesus Christ. Reconciliation. We're going to look at Colossians beginning uh, in chapter 1, verse 20, down to verse 23, but because the sentence begins in verse 19, that's where I begin. For it pleased the Father that in Him all the fullness should dwell, and by Him to reconcile all things to Himself, by Him, whether things on earth or things in heaven, having made peace through the blood of His cross, and you who were once alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now He has reconciled in the body of His flesh through death to present you holy and blameless and above reproach in His sight. If indeed you continue in the faith, grounded and steadfast, and are not moved away from the hope of the gospel which you have heard, which was preached to every creature under heaven, of which I, Paul, became a minister. Reconciliation is one of the most descriptive terms for our salvation and the greatness of our salvation in the Bible. And that word, reconciliation, goes alongside other terms that most of us are familiar with, terms like justification, or redemption, or forgiveness, or adoption. Now, those, those are Bible words. That's Christianese. And if you've been a Christian for any length of time and you've read through the Bible even once, you have come across these terms. John MacArthur, in his commentary, helps explain all of these great terms. He said, in justification, the sinner stands before God guilty and condemned, but is declared righteous. In redemption, the sinner stands before God as a slave, but is granted his freedom. In forgiveness, the sinner stands before God as a debtor, but the debt is paid and forgotten. In adoption, the sinner stands before God as a stranger, but is made a son. In reconciliation, the sinner stands before God as an enemy, but becomes his friend. So this is all about God becoming our friend reconciling that which is broken. Great story. Our third president, you know who that was? Jefferson, Thomas Jefferson. Thomas Jefferson, our third president, was riding his horse with a group of people, a group of men, um, government men across the country or across this part of the country where he was in uh, the northeast part of the United States. And um, he uh, comes to a river and because of the excessive flooding, the bridge that they wanted to cross has been washed away. So they have to ford across the river on their horses against the current. So a few men venture out and a few more men venture out. It's a pretty large group. But there's another man, not part of the group, watching all this from the shore. And he walks up to the horse where President Jefferson is sitting and asks him, if he wouldn't mind helping him, ferrying him across the river. Jefferson says, sure, absolutely, hop on, and puts him on his horse, and Jefferson, the president, takes him across safely on the other side of the river. On the other side of the river 
one of the members of Jefferson's group goes to the man and says, I have a question. Why did you go to the president and ask him to help you? And the man was shocked. He goes, I, I didn't know it, it was the president. Keep in mind, there was no social media in those days, no, no news that we people could really get a, a visual of, of who the president was. So he didn't know. And he said, all I know is that some of your faces was written the answer no. And on some was written the answer yes. His was a yes face. Reconciliation is God looking at you with a yes face, saying, yes, I will accept you. Yes, I will forgive you. Yes, I will adopt you. Yes, I will make you my own. Yes, you can be my son, my daughter. That is reconciliation. I want to give you four aspects of reconciliation. First of all, the meaning of it, then the magnitude of it, then the means of it, and then the measure of it. Let's begin with the meaning of it, and let's just kind of soak that word into our being in verse 20. And by Him, by Jesus, to reconcile all things to Himself, by Him, whether things on earth, things in heaven, having made peace through the blood of the cross, and you, who were once alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now He has reconciled. Twice in the passage, the word is used. Paul uses it several other places. The word reconcile or reconciliation is a Greek word, katalasso. Katalasso is a word that means literally to change or to exchange. To change or to exchange. So the idea then is to change enemies into friends or to exchange hostility for understanding and acceptance. That's the idea behind reconciliation. It is a word that is used to restore relationships between two parties that have formerly been at odds. It's moving from a place of separation to a place of restoration. It's exchange, exchanging fracture for fellowship. It's going from estrangement to endearment, even enjoyment. It's a full-orbed uh, change that occurs or exchange that occurs. Now, Paul uses the word in 1 Corinthians chapter 7 when he speaks about a wife being reconciled to her husband. He says if, if there's a woman and she's married, uh, she should not depart from her husband. If she departs from her husband, let her remain unmarried or be reconciled to her husband. Jesus uses the same word in Matthew chapter 5 to speak of a brother being reconciled to another brother. He said if you go to the altar and you have a gift, but you know your brother has something against you, leave your gift at the altar. First go be reconciled with your brother, then come and offer your gift. But here, here in Colossians 1, the word katalaso, reconcile, refers to human beings restored to right relationship with God. And because it is, Paul uses a slightly different word. It's katalaso, but there's a word next to it that makes it a compound word. In Greek, it's apa katalaso. And that's a preposition attached to the word. Anytime in Greek you put a preposition and you stick it on a word like that, it is meant to intensify the meaning. So the meaning here, apokatalasso, reconcile, reconciliation, means to change thoroughly or to reconcile completely. And I think Paul uses the term especially here because remember this group of heretics that are in Colossae, these would-be Gnostics who didn't believe that uh, you could go directly to God, that you had to go through these emanations to get to God, and that if you want to be made right with God, you have to go through these steps. And Paul is saying, no, God by himself, with no help from any other emanation, thank you, is perfectly powerful and capable to thoroughly reconcile humanity back to himself. And by the way, when it comes to being reconciled with God, it's a one-sided process. It's a one-sided process. Uh, notice in verse 20, and by him, 
that is by Jesus, to reconcile all things to himself. And look in verse 21. You were once alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now he has reconciled. When it comes to reconciliation, God is always, always, always the initiator. We love him because he first loved us. So God is the initiator. We are always the responder. The Bible never says we reconcile with God. The Bible always says God reconciles with us. 2 Corinthians 5.18, now all things are of God who has reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ. So God always initiates the move to restore what happened at the fall. That is reconciliation. Now, you might ask, why is that? I mean, why can't I make the first move? Why can't I reconcile with God? Why is it always God? Well, that takes us to the second part of the meaning of the word reconcile or reconciliation. In the Greek, the term katalasso was also used for financial transactions, and it meant a financial exchange. So in exchange for money, goods and services were rendered in equal value to the money that was paid. When the transaction was completed, those two parties were said to be reconciled. And we happen to use that term in, in a very similar way today. Uh, we speak of reconciling our bank account. Uh, We speak of reconciling our checkbook register, if you still use checks, or balancing our online account so that it's reconciled. Same idea. So for God to reconcile with us, there must be a transaction that occurs. I just want you to hold on to that thought. For God to reconcile with us, there must be a transaction that occurs. So that's the meaning of it. Let's now look at the magnitude of it. And for that, I take you also to verse 20. And by him to reconcile all things to himself. All things to himself. Whether things on earth or things in heaven, having made peace through the blood of his cross. And you, who were once alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now he is reconciled. So there's two categories of reconciliation. Number one, everything, all things, the universe, all created things. And number two, people in particular, human beings in particular. So first of all, all things. God's ultimate plan is to restore creation because a curse has been placed upon it because of the fall. So you remember how the story goes, right? When God first made stuff, he looked at it and said, what? It's good. God saw all that he made and said, behold, it is very good. But it didn't stay good long, did it? It went from good to bad, and a curse fell upon humanity because of Adam and sin, and good creation was marred by bad action. Man's curse brought sin and the need to reconcile creation back to God. Now, I ask you to put a marker in Romans 8, so turn to Romans 8 just for a second, and let's get some supplementary material which will help us understand. Romans chapter 8, verse 20 is where I'm going to begin reading, just a few verses. For the creation was subjected to futility, or a curse. Not willingly, there wasn't any creature that wanted it. No animal said, I'll sign up for a curse. Not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope. Because the creation itself also will be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groans and labors with birth pangs until now. We know what happened. We know the story. Sin disrupted the harmony between creation and creator. And God's plan from the beginning was to, at some point, restore all things back to himself. Now, uh, let me just press this a little bit because you might be thinking, well, so, so does all things mean like Satan, demons? 
No, let me, let me just qualify that. All things that are able to be reconciled, God will reconcile. It doesn't mean He's going to uh, save every human being. The Bible does not teach universalism that every person will be saved. The Bible does not teach that Satan and demons will say, okay, sorry, we goofed up. Can we just, we'll be friends now. That's never going to happen. The Bible promises in Revelation that Satan and his minions will be tormented in everlasting hell forever and ever. So it's pretty clear that all things being reconciled are all things that God is able to reconcile, will allow themselves to be reconciled. But here in particular, he's speaking of creation. And this is why we teach and believe and insist on a literal millennial kingdom, a literal thousand-year period where Jesus Christ reigns upon the earth. Why? Because only during that time will the effects of the curse be reversed and when those, when those effects are reversed, there's going to be dramatic changes in the universe, in the atmosphere, in the biosphere. There are so many texts of Scripture that give um, evidence of that. Let me just give you one. In uh, Isaiah chapter 11, the wolf also will dwell with the lamb, the leopard shall lie down with the young goat, the calf and the young lion and the fatling together, and a little child shall lead them. The cow and the bear shall graze, the young ones shall lie down together, the lion shall eat straw like the ox, the nursing child shall play by the cobra's hole. Honey, go out and play with the snakes. Take your kids with you. And the, the weaned child shall put his hand in the viper's den. The cursed creation will become uncursed, will become restored, will become, here it is, reconciled reconditioned. Every year we sing it. Every year we sing it at Christmas time. We sing Joy to the World, right? We think Joy to the World is about Christmas. Isaac Watts wrote the lyrics of that song, and he was writing about the second coming and the reconciliation in creation. Joy to the world, the Lord has come. Let earth receive her king. One of the verses says, no more let sin and sorrows grow, nor thorns infest the ground. He comes to make his blessings flow far as the curse is found. That's reconciliation of God's creation. So that's one category. Look at the next one in verse 21, and you. Now he's getting personal. If you want to know what it's going to be like, he's saying to the Colossians, look at yourselves. He has reconciled you. And you who were once alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now he has reconciled. People are the target. They're the primary ones that God is interested in reconciling with. Individuals, individual personal relationships. That's his target because that's God's crowning creation because mankind is in the image and likeness of God. And there's a problem. The reason people are the focus is because people are the ones alienated. Look at the verse. You were once alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works. God's reconciliation arises from mankind's miserable condition. God's reconciliation arises from man's miserable condition. It's what theologians call total depravity. Ever heard the term total depravity? Total depravity is the idea that because of the fall of man, there is not a single area of, of our lives that is not tainted and ruined and marred by sin. The idea of total depravity isn't that we are as bad as as we can be, that we're the worst possible people we can be, it means we are as bad off as we can possibly be. Before God, we are as bad off as it possibly gets. And the word here is alienated, estranged, separated from God. It's a persistent condition, hostility to God that begins in the mind, according to Paul here, and ends in our actions. It begins in the mind. Here's the problem. People hate God. Do people hate God? Yeah, people hate God. 
And you know why they hate God? The text says, wicked works. It says in the Gospel of John, men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. They love darkness rather than light because their deeds are evil. So they want to hold on to their stuff, their sin, their activity. They don't want anybody, any deity telling them, you need to change your lifestyle. And you bring God in and God will confront you with the alienation factor that things have to change. So that's total depravity. Alienated begins in our minds. You remember in Genesis 6, before God flooded the world, that he gives insight into what people were thinking. It says, every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Now, I've noticed this. You've noticed this. Nobody likes to hear this. There's not a person out there who's unsaved that likes to hear that they are alienated and separated from God and that they are sinners. That's not good news to them. That's like, what on earth? You know, that's, that's usually where we don't begin there. We usually begin with, do you know God loves you, right? We want to get, give them that message and then tell them the problem. But nobody likes to hear this truth. It is not the current philosophy of the world. The current philosophy of the world is this. I'm okay. You're okay. Everybody's good in their own way. Everybody's good in their heart. Really? If you're okay and I'm okay, if we're all okay, then why is this world so messed up? Want to know why it's messed up? You ready? You ready for it? It's your fault. It's your fault. It's my fault. It's our fault. All of us. It's our fault. In the uh, 17th century, um, uh, a lady by the name of Lady Huntington, who was a wealthy lady of substance and notoriety in England. She was a patron of many Christian leaders. She invited one of her friends, the Duchess of Buckingham, to hear George Whitfield preach. You know George Whitfield. He was the Anglican preacher who founded Methodism. He was the fiery preacher in England. So she brought her friend to hear George Whitfield preach. Well, the Duchess of Buckingham so hated what she heard in the sermon. And so she wrote her friend, Lady Huntington, this little note. It is monstrous to be told that you have a heart as sinful as the common wretches that crawl the earth. This is highly offensive and insulting, and I cannot but wonder that your ladyship should relish any sentiments so much at variance with high rank and good breeding. How can you listen to a preacher who says somebody as wonderful and marvelous as you and I are need help? That's pride speaking. That's alienation speaking. Alienated in, in the mind. So it's true that you are alienated. It's true that you are enemies of God by nature in your mind. But it's also true, look at verse 22, that he will present you holy, blameless, and above reproach in his sight. Let that seep into your soul. Holy, blameless, and above reproach. Now, I read that verse and I think, that does not sound like me. I am not blameless. I have bad moods. I get traffic tickets. I say selfish things. I think evil thoughts. So I'm not blameless. I'm not holy. But notice what it says. Blameless, holy, blameless, and above reproach in his sight. Something happens to change the way God sees you. That's reconciliation. Something happens to change his eyesight. It's like corrective lenses. Oh, wow. In his sight, before him, that is how you are presented. So that's the magnitude of reconciliation. We have the meaning and the magnitude. What's the means of it? How does it happen? Back to verse 20. And by him to reconcile all things to himself, by him whether things on earth or things in heaven, having made peace through the blood of the cross. Through the blood of the cross. 
Now, look at verse 22. In the body of his flesh through death. There's two clauses, and they basically mean the same thing. In two different verses, two separate clauses, but they're describing exactly the same thing. So you have peace through the blood of his cross in the body of his flesh through death. That's Paul saying Jesus physically died on a cross. And the reason he's belaboring it is he's writing to people who are tainted by Gnosticism who didn't believe Jesus had a physical body, but he was a phantom. So he, he died physically, his blood was shed literally, and that's the means by which we can be reconciled to God. Now, remember I said something a moment ago. I said, to be reconciled with God, a transaction has to be made. To be reconciled with God, there has to be a transaction that is made. This is that transaction. Here's how it works. Our bank account was in the red before God. We were bankrupt before God. The wages of sin is death, so separation. We were alienated. And crime demands payment for God to justly forgive sin. He can't just wink at it and go, yeah, not a big deal. That wouldn't be just. That wouldn't be fair. So payment has to be made for God to justly forgive. So what happened is what I like to call the great exchange or the great substitution. And for that, I want you to look at 2 Corinthians chapter 5. You turn there, so just flip over to 2 Corinthians 5 real quick to get some more material that beautifully explains what we just read. 2 Corinthians 5, verse 18. Now all things are of God, who has reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. That is that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their trespasses to them, and has committed to us the word of reconciliation. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ. As though God were pleading through us, we implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. For he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Now, on the surface, that's an awkward statement, not easy to understand, but there's a principle at work here. It's called the principle of imputation, imputation, or putting something to somebody's account. So Jesus stood in for us took the blame, took the rap, took the punishment. He became proxy for us. You know what the Bible says? He was wounded for our transgression. He was bruised for our iniquity. The chastisement for our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. That's the great exchange. So not imputing trespasses to them. Again, another bookkeeping term. He's not going to put that to your account. What it means is God decided to put your sin on Jesus' account books and put his righteousness onto your account books. And that's verse 21. For he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us. Not to be a sinner for us. Jesus was never a sinner. He never committed a sin. He was without sin, the Bible says. He made him who knew no sin to be sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God in Him. Let me put it another way. God the Father treated Jesus like you and I deserve to be treated so that He could treat us like Jesus Christ deserves to be treated. That's what that means. That's what that means. God treated Jesus like we deserve to be treated so He could treat you like Jesus deserves to be treated. I remember first time I heard the gospel, I had this thought. I said, God, you're not getting a good deal. I don't know why you want my life. Not much there. You're going to give me your righteousness, your salvation. Jesus gave his life for me. You want me to give my... I said, I, I don't get the exchange. It's, it's, it's like you're getting a bad deal. I, on the other hand, am getting the deal of the century. I will not walk away from this deal. So, that's the means of it. The shed blood on the cross in the body of his flesh. You know, there's three basic ways, three basic ways that people 
lean on, believe in, to get right with God. None of them work. There's a fourth, and it's outlined here, but here's, here's the three basic ways. Number one, by being good. Most people say, well, uh, if my good deeds outweigh my bad deeds, then I'll go to heaven because good people go to heaven. That's, I don't know where they got that from. Good people don't go to heaven. Do you believe that good people go to heaven? Saved people go to heaven. That's who goes to heaven. But they think if I'm good, if my good deeds outweigh my bad deeds, this is what Muslims believe. Every Ramadan, Jews at Yom Kippur want their good deeds to outweigh their bad deeds. So they believe by being good. Here's the problem, Isaiah 64, all our righteousness is like filthy rags. Whatever good thing you can do ain't good enough. Might be good for you or your neighbor or your friend, but not for holy, perfect God. Not good enough. That's, that's one, by being good. Another basic thing people do is by being religious. If I go to church, if I keep rigorous disciplines, if I observe rituals, if I obey laws, if I take a pilgrimage to a holy place. And so many people have turned Christianity into a religion of self-effort and self-righteousness. Yeah. It doesn't work. A third way people try to get right with God is just by being sincere. They say it doesn't matter what you believe or, or not believe. What really matters is are you sincere? And if you're sincere, you'll get to heaven. Problem with that is Proverbs 14 says, there is a way that seems right to every man, but it leads to death. The fourth way is the only way. And that's this way. And, and the way is reconciliation initiated by God through His Son. The means is the blood of His cross. It's going to include the whole universe, but it's specifically for you. And He's going to exchange your badness for His goodness, exchange um, your sin for His righteousness. That's the idea. And it only happens through the death of His Son. I remember hearing about a husband and wife. They had one son, an only child. That son died tragically, sadly. They buried that child. Subsequently, as often happens in marriages like this, the relationship got strained after the death of their son. Uh, they separated, and he moved to a different part of the country. She stayed in town. And so now they were apart. One day, he was back in town on business. Of course, he went to the cemetery and stood at the grave of his son and spent several minutes, maybe hours. And he was about to walk away, and he heard a noise behind him, and he turned, and it was his estranged wife walking up to visit her son as well. When they saw each other, their first impulse was to separate, to kind of go back. But then they grabbed hands because, because there was something they shared in common. What they shared in common was a dead son. They both had interest in that grave. And they reconciled over the death of their only son. Our reconciliation took nothing less than the death of God's only Son. And that is the means of our reconciliation. So that's the meaning, the magnitude, and the means. Let's close with this, the measure of it. Look at verse 23, which closes out this paragraph. If indeed, so all this is great and true and cool, if indeed, hmm, I don't like that word if. If indeed you continue in the faith, grounded and steadfast, and are not moved away from the hope of the gospel which you heard, which was preached to every creature under heaven, which I, Paul, became a minister. Sort of sounds like a contradiction of all that has gone before, or at least an addition to grace. It almost sounds like Paul is saying, now, now once God has reconciled you, you got to work hard to keep it. Now, that's not it. Paul is simply being practical. Paul is giving us a gauge 
a way for us to measure our lives to see if we really are reconciled to God. He's not saying you become holy and blameless and above reproach by your devotion. He is not saying that you as a Christian may or may not continue in the faith. He simply, by this statement, assumes that you will. Because you've been reconciled, he assumes that you will continue. In fact, the best Greek construction of this sentence reads like this. If indeed you continue in the faith, and I'm sure you will, and not moved away from the hope of the gospel which you heard, which is preached to every creature under heaven. So here's the point. The gospel doesn't work like magic. You still got to cooperate. Your will is still involved. And, and, and here's the simple measure. Here's the, here's the measure. Here's the gauge. Real faith leads to real results. Those real results become the gauge of real faith. It's that simple. Real faith produces real results, and the real results become the measure, the gauge of real faith. One of the most sobering facts in the Bible is that not everyone who thinks they're saved is saved. Not everyone who claims to follow Christ and be a child of God really is. Jesus said, many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord. And Jesus will say to them, you know what he's going to say, depart from me, you workers of iniquity, I never knew you. So one of the marks of being converted is staying faithful. Conversion leads to continuity. Salvation leads to service. That's reconciliation. And that's the gauge. Oh, I'm reconciled to God. Look, I see the evidence. I'm not perfect, but I'm growing step by step. Yeah, I'm not what I could be. I'm not what I should be, but I'm not what I was. Amen. That's the gauge. You can see it. It's evident. I'm going to close with a story. A building engineer was up on a scaffold, three-story high scaffold. The engineer slipped. They were at a construction site. He fell. It appeared that it's going to be a fatal fall. Three stories on a scaffold. Lights out. He's, we're going to bury this boy. And he plummets to the ground. Below him on the scaffold is a worker, a laborer, who looks up as he is falling down, realizes that he is standing exactly where the engineer is going to land. Something came over him, and he braced himself on the poles of that scaffold, and he absorbed the full impact of the fall. The man fell on him. The impact slightly injured the engineer who fell down, but severely hurt the laborer. Several bones were broken, and after he recovered, he could no longer work. He was severely disabled and handicapped. Years later, a reporter found that man, that worker, now handicapped, and asked how the engineer has treated him since the accident. He was going to write a story. And the man said, he has given me half of all he owns, including a share of his business. He's always concerned about my needs, never lets me lack anything. Almost every day he gives me some token of thanks or remembrance. You see, the engineer who was saved became the servant of the one who saved him. That's the gauge. That's the gauge. Our gauge, our gauge, our measure to see if we are really reconciled to God and not just spouting off, yeah, I follow, I believe, is this. You continue in the faith, grounded, steadfast, and you're not moved away from the hope of the gospel which you heard. Now, Paul wrote, and we already read it, so I'm not going to go back to it in 2 Corinthians 2 Corinthians 5, he said, look, I'm God's ambassador. I'm pleading with you. Be reconciled to God. And I'm pleading with you. If you're not reconciled to God, be reconciled to God. I'm pleading with you. I'm begging you for your own good. God will exchange 
your sin for his righteousness. God will change thoroughly the relationship and change your life. He wants to reconcile you. All things, yes, but you in particular. He's provided the means, the substitute, the perfect one, and he has made the first move. But he will not save you. He will not save you if you don't want him to save you. In fact, he loves you so much, he will honor your choice if you want to spend forever in hell. He'll honor that. You can do that. God is pro-choice when it comes to eternity. He'll let anybody make a choice where they want to spend eternity. But I plead with you, be reconciled to God. And if you're watching anywhere in the world, on our channel, and you're joining Calvary Church at home, be reconciled. You can do it right where you are. I'm going to lead you in a prayer, and you can do it here right where you're seated. Just say, Lord, I give you my life. I admit that I am a sinner. Please forgive me. Forgive me. I believe in Jesus. I believe he died for me. I believe he rose again for me. I repent of my sin. I turn from my past. I turn to Jesus as my Savior. I want to follow him as my Lord. Help me to do that. Thank you for reconciling myself to yourself for clearing the path and establishing the relationship. Thank you, Lord, that you are so moved by our miserable condition of being alienated from you that you have moved to reconcile us to yourself. Change thoroughly the relationship. Thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. You can stand to your feet. Um, if you're watching at home, of course, you don't have to stand to your feet, but you can if you'd like. But if you did pray that prayer and you are part of our online audience, would you text the word LIFE? I love that. Text the word LIFE to area code 505-509-5433. Text the word LIFE to 505-509-5433. Or uh, go on to our website, calvarynm.church, slash know God. Boy, there's so many addresses out there, but everybody's used to it by now. calvarynm.church, slash know God, and somebody will be there to respond right where you're at. Thank you so much for joining us for this message from Calvary Church. We would love to know how this message impacted you. Share your story with us. Email mystory at calvarynm.church. And if you'd like to support this Bible teaching ministry with a financial gift, visit calvarynm.church give.